23, the time for member statements has concluded. The Prime Minister with ministerial arrangements. Yes, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, the Trade Minister uh, will be absent from question time today as he's travelling to China to attend the annual Joint Ministerial Economic Commission, and the Minister for Foreign Affairs will answer questions on his behalf. I thank the Prime Minister. If members could just take their seats, uh, we can begin question time. The member for Grainler and the Minister for Immigration and Border Protection, if uh, you could take your seats as quickly as possible. I'll just wait for the member for Jagger Jagger and to allow the member for Lingiari past. <laughs> Questions without notice. The member for Port Adelaide. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Energy. Can the Minister confirm that yesterday he claimed in the House, and I quote, since the start of the coalition government in 2013, prices across average Sydney households on standing offers have varied from increasing by $1 to falling by $473? Is this Liberal government so out of touch that they believe power prices have gone down since they were elected? And if so, does the minister want to spend the next three minutes claiming that working families in Australia have never been better off? Members on my right, the Leader of the House and the member for Boothby, the Minister for Environment and Energy has the call. Well, the member for Port Adelaide has some cheek, Mr Speaker. He has some cheek because in this House, he told a falsehood, Mr Speaker. He told a falsehood. Now let me first deal with his question. Let me first deal with his question. We have tabled information in the Parliament to indicate that as of July 1st we saw power bills increase in Sydney. AGL increased it by $296, Origin increased by $310, Energy Australia by $320. But if you look back in the years since we came to government, you saw big drops, for example, when we abolished the carbon tax, Mr Speaker. Now, we abolished the carbon tax. Now, the member for Port Adelaide should know that. The member for Port Adelaide should know that because he put out a newsletter, Mr Speaker. He put out his own newsletter which said the decision to terminate the carbon tax will save the average family around $380. Mr Speaker, so, so that is what he said, and we know. And the Prime Minister, <laughs> what a genius! And the Prime Minister knows that the ACCC has confirmed that the average Australian household has saved overall about $550 from the abolition of the carbon tax. So we have said, we have said that power prices have increased, and we are working to do everything we can to put downward pressure on power prices. And the Australian people are rightly concerned about rising power prices. But not the leader of the opposition. Not the leader of the opposition. Now, the member for Port Adelaide. Let's remind the House what he said yesterday. Let's remind the House what the member for Port Adelaide said yesterday. He said the Australian Energy Regulator and the Australian Energy Market Commission had produced data which had indicated that the average Sydney household had seen their power prices increase by $1,000. Well, now we have tabled in the Parliament. We've tabled in the Parliament. We've tabled in the Parliament statements from both the Australian Energy Market Commission and the Australian Energy Regulator, contradicting the Labor Party, Mr. Speaker. They have manipulated, deceived the Australian people by using data that never existed, Mr. Speaker. Data that never existed. So it's up to the leader of the opposition. It's up to the member for Port Adelaide. It's up to the dozen other members opposite to come to the dispatch box to apologise for the Australian people and to set the record straight, Mr Speaker. To set the record straight. Because the Australian people know that when the Labor Party was in office, power bills increased by over 100 per cent. That was the record. They are selling out blue-collar workers in order to win green votes in the city, and only the Turnbull government will help create an affordable and reliable power system. The member for Swan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister update the House on what the government is doing to ensure Australians have affordable and reliable electricity, including in my electorate of Swan? 
And is the Prime Minister aware of any alternative approaches? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank member you, for Mr. Griffith. Speaker, and I, I thank the uh, honourable member for his question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as we've seen from today's job data, our commitment to jobs and growth is not a slogan, it's an outcome. Yeah. Strong, strong jobs growth. But to continue that, 325,600 jobs in the last 12 months. But to maintain that strong growth, Australians need affordable and Bruce. reliable electricity. Yeah. And Mr Speaker, what we have seen is Labor Party policies driving prices up. They've gone up over the last 18 months or so because of the closure of a big baseload power station in Hazelwood and, above all, by the high price of gas. So we do know, too, that the Coalition's policy of abolishing the carbon tax brought prices down. So Coalition policies have brought prices down and the inherited consequence of Labor Party's mistakes, particularly with respect to gas, and particularly by overlooking the pretty obvious fact that the wind doesn't blow all the time and the sun doesn't show all the time, because they, because they overlooked all of that, Mr Speaker, we have seen a dramatic rise in prices. But we are taking action in the medium term, the long term and right now, and we've seen gas prices starting to come down because of our foreshadowed limitations on exports. But I want to talk, Mr Speaker, about what we've done to help families with their bills today. And I want to talk about the way we brought in the electricity retailers and we said to them, we know that two million of your customers at least are paying more than they need to for electricity. What are you going to do about it? You owe an obligation to them. We said to those big energy bosses, you've got to look after your the customers Prime Minister will resume and let his them know. Prime Minister will resume his seat. The member for Burt on a point of order. Relevance, Mr Speaker. The member for Swan asked a very the direct member question for about energy in Western. Seat. The member for Burt will resume his seat. The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, and we asked, we asked about what, what they would do for their uh, customers, and they're advising them that they've got those that are on the wrong plan, that they are on the wrong plan, and thousands of people are getting a better deal. And Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we've seen so many reports in the paper, but I'll refer to one. Christine De Costa, a single mother with four children living in Brisbane. She used the Energy Made Easy website of the federal government found a better deal that will save her three hundred dollars. Now that's action for her. That's real money. The Labor Party scoff at a three hundred dollar saving. It means a lot to Christine and her family. And it's an indication of how out of touch Labor is that they are not prepared to support the government in keeping energy affordable and reliable. Just before I call the member for Lindsay, the members for Bert and Lyons uh, regularly asked to cease interjecting. I'm just placing them both on notice now. The member for Lindsay has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Energy. Yesterday, the Minister said power bills for Sydney households had gone down by more than $470 since this government was elected. Does this minister honestly expect households in my electorate to believe that compared to 2013, their power bills had actually gone down by more than $470 per year? The Minister for the Environment and Energy. Come in, Spinner, Mr. Speaker. Come in, Spinner. Because the honourable member should know that under the Labor Party, the power bills would always be higher, Mr. Speaker. Much higher, Mr. Speaker, because the Labor Party did not support the abolition of the carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. The Labor Party did nothing, and the ACCC have told us that as a result of the abolition of the carbon tax, the Australian average household has been better off overall by $550. Now, the Prime Minister, with the retailers, is seeing millions of Australians get a better deal. And we know that 50 per cent of Australian households have not moved retailers or contracts in the last five years, despite them being able to make savings of more than $1,000 
or more, Mr. Speaker. And what about the networks? Under the Labor Party, the regulator returns were around 10 per cent, Mr. Speaker. Under the coalition now, it's just above 6 per cent, Mr. Speaker. That means those people in Sydney can be up to $300 a year better off. And what about the decision to abolish the limited merits review process to stop the networks gaming the system? Well, those honourable members opposite who live in New South Wales were just slugged an additional $3.5 billion, Mr. Speaker, courtesy of that limited merits review process. If the Labor Party had done anything when they were in office to abolish that, as consumers in New South Wales would have been three and a half billion dollars better off. That is why we have taken action on this front. This is why also the Prime Minister has worked diligently to ensure that there's more gas supplied into the domestic market, and we have seen the spot market fall, Mr. Speaker. But I have to say, I have to say, the Labor Party. The Labor Party, without having any answers on energy policy and a track record of a 100 per cent increase, has actually left itself vulnerable now to the point that it is making up, making up the facts, Mr. Speaker, facts that they have been contradicted, contradicted by the Australian Energy Regulator and by the Australian Energy Market Commission. The Leader of the Opposition sent out, sent out a tweet, Mr Speaker, saying that the Liberals have delivered power bills that have been more than $1,000, Mr Speaker. Well, we've heard from the Australian Energy Market Commission and the Australian Energy Regulator that that is false. This reminds us of the Medi scare, Mr Speaker. This reminds us of the shameful Medi scare lie. The shameful Medi scare lie. I call the member for Ballarat. The, the opposition member to become for Ballarat a brave is warned. Part to come to the dispatch box, to come clean with the Australian people, to stop the deceit, to stop the lies, to stop the falsehoods, to correct the record and tell the Australian people that he has been telling falsehoods and deceiving them about the power will prices. Resume his, seat. his time has concluded. I call the member for Flynn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister, the Minister for Agriculture, Water resources, resources Member in Northern McEwen. Australia. Will the Deputy Prime Minister inform the House how the government is working to deliver more reliable and affordable energy for agricultural businesses across Australia, including my electorate of Flynn? Is he aware of any alternative approaches? The Deputy Prime Minister has the call. Well, um, well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Member and I thank Hunter. the honourable Happy member Lindell, for his mate. question. Happy and it's, and I note that we have had great success in agriculture. It's been a great honour. We've soon, I'll soon have been the minister for four years, so it's a great honour. And we've seen the results this year with uh, agriculture growing by 22.6 per cent, 22.6 per cent in the last year. In fact, agriculture was the fastest growing sector in the GDP figures. And that goes to show you what a difference a good government makes. And if you want to see that in a more anecdotal form, you can see it in such things as table grapes, which grew by 370 per cent in, from 2015 to 2016. Or you can see it in chickpeas to India, which grew by 90 per cent in 2016 to 2017. Or you could see it in the increase in live cattle volume, something that the Labor Party shut down. They're good at shutting down things, shut down coal fire power, shut down the live cattle trade. Well, to Indonesia, since 2013, they've grown by 94 per cent. From Vietnam, since 2013, they've grown by 1,673 per cent. To China, since 2013, 106 per cent. But it's not just in those areas where we've seen a, a change in agriculture. We've seen $724 million lent out in concessional loans. We've seen 4,000 kilometres of dog fences built to bring sheep back into the western districts. We have put the legislation together to build a $4 billion regional development, regional investment corporation in, in, in Orange. In the last round of applications for APVMA in Armidale, 450 applicants. 450 applicants, country of origin labelling, so people in this nation know where their food comes from and the proportion of food comes from, so they can back in Australian workers, so they can back in Australian workers. We're rolling that out. The wine equalisation tax reforms and the wine reforms will see our wine industry go from 2.3 billion to 3.5 billion by 2020. We have set out a process of making sure we deal with invasive species such as parthenium, prickly acacia, blackberries, 
We have also started water infrastructure. In Tasmania, we are seeing water infrastructure rolled out. McAllister Irrigation, Irrigation District in Victoria, Loddon Widmer Pipeline, the Northern Adelaide Irrigation Scheme, recycled water. But there is one threat to it, of course, it's power prices, because people of Australia know that they cannot trust. They cannot trust the Shifty member for Maribyrnong. They cannot trust him. They couldn't trust him with the figures yesterday. They can't trust him today. The blue collar workers can't trust the member for Maribyrnong. Mr Rudd could not trust the member for Maribyrnong. Mrs Ms Gillard could not trust the member for Maribyrnong. Labor can't trust the member for Maribyrnong. We can't trust the member for Maribyrnong. And the Australian people can no longer trust the member for Maribyrnong. The member for Chifley. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Energy. This government is now in its fifth year in office. Why did the Minister tell Sydney householders their power prices have gone down? Why doesn't this Liberal government understand that people in my electorate are doing it tough? Just how out of touch is this Liberal government? The Minister for Energy and the Environment. Just, just repeating, repeating a false Mr. Mr Speaker, the member for Chifley is not a bad bloke, but he's got his facts wrong again, Mr Speaker. He's not a bad bloke, but he's got his facts wrong again, because again the Labor Party is repeating the falsehoods in this place, misleading the Australian people, making facts up on the run, deceiving them about what the Australian Energy Regulator, what the Australian Energy Market Commission have said, Mr Speaker. The reality is that power prices in Sydney have recently gone up, Mr Speaker, have recently gone up. We've seen in July a substantial increase, and we've also seen in 2016 an increase. The years prior, we saw some decreases, Mr. Speaker, but nothing like the 100 per cent increase that we saw under the Labor Party. And as the Prime Minister has said, we are cleaning up Labor's mess, Mr. Speaker. Their failure, their failure to heed Member the warnings of their own energy white paper, their failure to heed the warnings of the Australian energy market operator when it came to setting up large exports of gas from the East Coast and the impact that that would have on shortfalls and on price. And we know that gas is increasingly setting the price of electricity, Mr Speaker. If the Labor Party had only been sensible, if they'd only had some foresight, if they had only prepared then we wouldn't have been in the situation where we are today with gas prices tripling over the last five years, Mr Speaker. And what about their idiocy when it comes to coal, Mr Speaker? The member for Hunter, who's wi waving the white flag over Liddell, Mr Speaker, who's refusing to stand up for his workers, who will go Hi, into Cole. Newcastle, write in the Newcastle member Herald, I'm the best friend of the coal workers, and then come into this place and vote for motions that says coal has no future in Australia, Hi, Mr Speaker. That is the, what the member for Hunter. And what about the member for Shortland, Mr Speaker? In his maiden speech, he bashes his chest. He bashes his chest and he says, I'm the great friend of coal. I'm a descendant of coal workers. But in this place, he's overseeing policies that will close our coal-fired power stations, even though coal is a source of reliable and affordable power, Mr Speaker. There's a clear line of difference on this side of the, the House compared Fisher. to those opposite. Those opposite want to join with the Greens to sell our blue-collar workers to try to win some votes in the inner city. We on this side of the House want to stand up for manufacturers. We want to stand up for industries, like in the member for Wannan's electorate, the okay, and the member for Gray's electorate, Mr. Speaker. The we Minister can resume with his the seat for a second. The member for Patterson and the member for Barker are carrying on a conversation. They can now continue it outside the chamber. They can both leave under 94A. The Minister has the call. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, and the member for Chefley might be listening to the rest of the answer to his question if he continues to interject. Mr. Speaker, the minister has the call. After the Labor Party's record of a 100% increase in power prices, only the Turnbull government will ensure a reliable and affordable power system. Just before I call the member for Indi, I'd like to welcome in the gallery to my left former speaker Harry Jenkins. Yeah. Who's uh, here 
who's here with Global Voices. Welcome, uh, Harry, back for the day. And I call the member for Indi. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Immigration and Border Protection, and it's about Manus Island. Can, minister, can you, Minister, provide details of the government's plan to manage the closure of the regional processing centre on 31 October? As this week, I've had numerous representations from my constituents, Rural Australians for Refugees, UNHCR and the Red Cross, seeking more information and a response from the government that shows that we can both protect our borders and show compassion, mercy and justice. The Minister for Immigration and Border Protection. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank the honourable member for her question. Uh, I know that it's a heartfelt question, and on a number of occasions the honourable member has made representations to me on behalf of children who are here on visas, uh, people who are here on visas otherwise uh, that may have illnesses that uh, want an extended stay in Australia, and I acknowledge her compassion and the work that she does in this area. It's important to her, it's important to her community, and I'm very pleased to take the question from her today. I can inform the member that I met with uh, Prime Minister O'Neill in Port Moresby on the 1st of September, and we continued uh, our case as uh, from the Australian government's perspective, uh, that is that we want to see the regional processing centre closed by the 31st of October. There's obviously a lot of details and uh, logistics to be worked through, and some of the compound has already been dismantled, so that process will continue. Uh, Prime Minister O'Neill expressed to me that his government was intent on seeing the regional processing centre close as well. And we have spoken with Prime Minister O'Neill and with my counterpart, uh, the new minister, Petrus Thomas, about the way in which uh, the logistics could operate, which might include, for example, those people which total about 200 that have been found not to be refugees uh, to be moved into an alternative place of detention away from the regional processing centre, given that they have no lawful claim to be in PNG. There are in total uh, just under 100 or so who have applied for uh, packages to go back to their country of origin. We've had a record number of people that have taken up offers to return back to their country of origin, given that they don't have legitimate claims to make in PNG. Uh, there is the capacity within the East Lorengau uh, Centre for about 400 people to be accommodated there, and we will work with the PNG government uh, in helping them provide the services uh, to those people. We have to do it in a way, going to uh, the compassionate aspect uh, uh, and the spirit in which uh, the member asked this question. We have to do it in a way where we don't want to see boats restart. And what all of us recognise is that the threat of people smuggling has not gone away. Over the course of the last couple of years, over the success of Operation Sovereign Borders, we've had to turn back 31 boats, and we've done that in a way where we've seen no loss of life. All of us have seen the pictures, heard the accounts of the women and children being pulled from the water, half-eaten bodies and all of the graphic detail that goes with it. And we have not presided over a death at sea under this government, and I don't intend to start now. That's the most, that is the most compassionate response that we can provide, so we aren't going to put ourselves in a position where we see boats restart. We've been very clear that if people on Manus Island or on Nauru have sought to come to our country by boat, they will not ever settle permanently in this country, and that's the message that the people smugglers need to continue to hear today. Just before I call the member for Banks, I'd just like to inform the House we've just had join us in the gallery this afternoon a visiting parliamentary delegation from China led by Mr Li Fei. On behalf of the House, I extend a very warm welcome to you. The member for Banks. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer update the House on what the government's economic policies uh, have meant for the creation of Australian jobs? including in my electorate of banks. Is the Treasurer aware of the effects alternative policies will have on hardworking Australians seeking to get and stay in jobs? The Treasurer has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for banks for his question and the great work he's doing as chair of the House Economics Committee and uh, contributing to the strong economic policies of the Turnbull government. Well, over the past four years, Mr Speaker, this government has been cleaning up the mess left behind by the Labor Party, yeah. cleaning up the mess, whether it was what we just heard about from the Minister for Immigration, 
uh, turning around at the border protection disasters of the previous government or cracking down on thuggish unions, making sure multinationals pay their fair share of tax, completing trade agreements uh, that the others left idle, turning around our defence spending. We've been cleaning up the, 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 the abhorrent mess left by the Labor Party, yeah, Mr yeah, Speaker. Yeah. But one area we've, we've had great success is we've turned around the anemic growth in jobs which was left to us by those opposite, which was about 1,800 a month. That is now 27,000 jobs every month, Mr Speaker. We have now had 11 consecutive months of jobs being created, and that is the longest run in 23 years. 23 years, it's the longest run of consecutive monthly job growth. We've had 800,000 and more get a job in this country in the last four years. More than 500,000 of those have got a job in the last two years, Mr. Speaker, which has seen the unemployment rate drop by half a percent over that period of time. 54,000 people went out there and got a job in the month of August. But importantly, part of that, 40,000 of those were full time, and 26,000 of those were young people. And in the last, Mr. Speaker, in the last six months, 63,000 young Australians have got a job. 63,000. That is the strongest six-month gain in youth employment since the global financial crisis. Australians are getting a job. Young people are getting a job as well, Mr. Speaker, which is incredibly important. It's also worth noting that over the last last six months, a quarter of a million full-time jobs have been created, Mr. Speaker, and that is the strongest six-month gain since the Sydney Olympics. And that's an incredible achievement. 17 years ago, 80% of the jobs that have been created in the past year have been full-time, and uh, that is the strongest growth in six and a half years. The number of people who are joining the labour force is up as well, and the level of underemployment is down on the latest figures, and underutilisation is down. Now I'm asked about alternatives. The leader of the opposition has a plan to increase taxes, increase taxes on the Australian economy by more than $150 billion. The leader of the opposition, the shiftiest leader of the opposition we've seen in a very long time, if he slithers into the lodge, he is going to put a big, wet, soggy blanket on jobs. This government is delivering jobs, Mr Speaker. We are delivering jobs at record rates, Mr Speaker. Those opposite want to shut jobs in everything from the coal-fired power stations to the booming the service industries where we're growing concluded. exports. The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thanks, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Your Minister for Energy has claimed that since 2013 power prices have gone down in Sydney. Is he right? Members on both sides. The member for Rankin, member for Karangamite, the Treasurer. The Prime Minister has the call. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the technique of the Leader of the Opposition is to tell one falsehood after another and then hope that by repeating it, it will be Member cut for Goldstein. Through. He has no regard for the truth whatsoever. He, he misled the House and was condemned for it today. Yeah. He misled the Australian people by claiming that the Australian energy regulators' figures showed exactly. that under the time of the coalition government, electricity prices for average Sydney households had gone up by $1,000. Exactly. As has been aptly demonstrated in the House today, that was completely untrue. It was no basis in fact. He took, he took the name of two important government agencies, the AER, the Reg Energy Regulator, and the Energy Market Commission, and he said they showed that prices had gone up by $1,000 in, in the four years of the coalition government. He said he stood out at a doorstep, doorstop, and he said, and I quote, Mr. The Speaker, Prime Minister will just uh, resume his seat for a second. The Manager of Opposition Business on a point of order. Members on my right, the Manager of Opposition Business on a point of order. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. On direct relevance, the question could not have been more specific about whether the or not the Prime Minister agrees business. with his Minister will. for Energy. The Manager of Opposition Business will resume his seat. The Prime Minister is addressing the claim in the question. He's entitled to address it by staying on the policy topic, which he's doing. 
is completely in order. The Prime Minister has yeah, the call. Yeah. Mr. Question, Mr. Speaker, electricity prices are not a question of opinion. They're a question of fact. And we know what the facts are, and the facts were misrepresented by the Labor Party. They were deliberately misrepresented by the Labor Party. The, the Leader of the Opposition said the research shows. The research. What research? The Labor research. What research? No, no research, no facts, and they repeated it again and again. Now, as I have said, and as the Energy Minister has said, we know what happened. The coalition came into government. It, it abolished the Member carbon tax. Electricity prices went down. Exactly. That's it. Coalition policies resulted in electricity prices going down. Labor voted against that. And then we have seen in recent times, in particularly in the course of the last 12 months, very large increases in electricity prices. Why have we the seen that? Sydney. We've seen that. The member for Sydney is warned. We've seen that because of the closure of Hazelwood, the failure to provide enough backup to renewables, and the soaring price of gas. And all of that is the consequence of Labor failures. And these are all problems Labor created that we're seeking to, to address. But Mr Speaker, what, you've got to, what we've got to recognise is that despite saying something that was patently untrue, despite telling falsehoods about Member the views sure. of two important regulators, despite misleading the House, exactly. the Leader of the Opposition has never had the courage the to come to the dispatch box. And I... The Member for Shortland is now warned. The Member for Goldstein. Has Thank the you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Defence Industry representing the Minister for Employment. Will the Minister outline to the House why it is important, important that employer and employee organisations always act in the best interests of their members? And is the Minister aware of alternative approaches? The Minister for Defence Industry representing the Minister for Employment. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I see uh, my friends on the other side are still standing up for John Setka, as usual, Mr Speaker. They like trashing public servants who work hard. They like trashing the public servants who put themselves, in fact, their bodies on the line against the CFMEU, and they stand up for John Setka instead, Mr Speaker. Yesterday, Mr Speaker, the federal court handed down record fines against the CFMEU of $2.4 million, Mr Speaker. $2.4 million. And the judge at the centre of that decision, Judge Geoffrey Flick, said, it's not difficult, it is difficult, if not impossible, to envisage any worse conduct than that pursued by the CFMEU, Mr Speaker. The jury is so in on the CFMEU, and yet still the Leader of the Opposition refuses to expel the CFMEU from the Labor Party, and he continues to take their donations. Their donations from the CFMEU, but since he's been the leader, now total $8 million, Mr Speaker. So the CFMEU has very, very deep pockets. They have deep pockets to be able to bankroll the, C the Labor Party, the particularly in Victoria. Minister, for a second. I couldn't have been more clear with the member for Lyons at the start of question time. He can leave under 94A. He's clearly chosen to be ejected. The minister has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So they clearly are pleased to bankroll the Labor Party in Victoria, and they're also quite happy to pay these fines. They've been fined again and again and again. As Judge Geoffrey Flick said, the CFMEU has repeatedly sought to place itself above the law. The CFMEU's conduct exposes a cavalier disregard for the prior penalties imposed by this court. And so, Mr Speaker, it's the responsibility of the leaders in Australia to lead by example and to say to the CFMEU, you're not welcome in the Labor Party until you get your act together, Mr Speaker. Bob Hawke was, was tough enough and John Cain were tough enough to stand up to the BLF. The Leader of the Opposition allows the CFMEU into every single forum of the Labor Party in Victoria into their pre-selections, into their policy-setting processes, into the governance of the Labor Party. The CFMEU and the Labor Party are in lockstep, Mr Speaker. One of the union leaders, one of the CFMEU leaders who was fined yesterday, 
or their union was fined yesterday, at the Barangaroo site in Sydney, described the investigators from the Fair Work Commission as being worse than pedophiles, Mr. Speaker. Worse than pedophiles. A union leader said that a public servant doing his job was worse than a pedophile. And these are the kind of people the Leader of the Opposition stands up for. He's now got the cash for stacks scandal in Victoria to deal with, Mr Speaker, the cesspit that is the Labor Party in Victoria, and this Leader of the Opposition sits on the top of that time cesspit. Has concluded. Member for Jagger Jagger, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you. My question is to the Prime Minister. Just over three months ago, the Prime Minister said about the clean energy target, and I quote, it has a lot of merit. As I say, we will look at it very favourably. And his own chief scientist said the clean energy target was urgent and will put downward pressure on power prices. More than three months on from that report, will the government implement the clean energy target, yes or no? The Prime Minister has the call. Well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the, the government Member for Wills. will deliver an energy policy, a final completed energy policy for the long term, which encourages investment, which ensures we make an orderly transition to a lower emission future. We do so in a way that uses all technologies, including coal. Member for Hunter, you don't have to write it all off. You don't have to write it all off. He's, he's, uh, he's full of smiles today. I tell you what. There won't be a lot of smiles at the Musselbrook Workers Club when he gets back home. I can tell you, when he gets back there, gets back there, and they learn about his efforts to put them out of work. Oh yes, not a rostered day off. It'll be a rostered rest of their lives off if he has his way. Well, Mr. Speaker, we'll look. Don't worry. I can say to the member for Hunter, he can say to his, uh, say to his, uh, his mates there in Musselbrook, he can say, don't worry, the government will look after you. The coalition will look after you, and we will. We will. We've got their best interests at heart, even if the member for Hunter and the member for Shortland have forgotten about them. But, Mr Speaker, turning to the, the policy, for Shortland turning has to the been policy issue, we have already put in place important measures which are bringing down people's electricity bills in the here and now because they're getting big discounts and getting onto the right plan. And I've talked about exactly. that. Exactly. And I know honourable members opposite they describe it as a stunt. They did nothing. But you know, if you are a single mum and you're getting three hundred dollars cut from your, le your electricity bill, yep. that is big money, that is real money. And uh, honourable members opposite shouldn't be uh, so sarcastic just because they're earning big money here in Parliament. Uh, and Mr Speaker, we also talk about well we also Mr Speaker Well Mr Speaker Mr Speaker Mr Speaker Yes he, well the biggest the, the, we know we also have the scoffer in chief there uh, the member for Maribyrnong he's the one he's the one that describes the leader of the opposition the leader of the opposition the leader of the opposition it's not as much as a union official no. The Prime Minister has the call. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. He's the one that described uh, Snowy Hydro too. The, the Prime Minister will resume his project. seat. The Prime Minister will resume his seat. The leader of the op the Prime Minister resume the leader of the opposition needs to withdraw that. We, I, I've cautioned him. <laughs> yeah, I withdraw. Prime Minister has the call. No bargain, do you? <laughs> Prime Minister has the call. Thanks, sir. Well, Mr. Speaker, whether they're scoffing about single mothers getting $300 off their electricity bill, whether they're scoffing at the largest electricity uh, renewable energy project to be built in Australia since the first Snowy scheme, whether they're scoffing about taking action to bring down the price of gas, they cannot escape the fact that their complacency, their incompetence, their negligence has brought these high prices to Australians, and no matter how many falsehoods they tell about us, about us, the about Prime Minister's prices, time Australians has concluded. know what they're up to, and that is putting Australians the member for Boothby. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Revenue and Financial Services. Will the Minister update the House on the action the government is taking to ensure that the interests of hard-working Australians 
are put ahead of the vested interests in the superannuation industry. Why is it important that we act to improve the transparency of super funds? The Minister for Revenue and Financial Services. I'd like to thank very much the member for Boothby for her question. The Turnbull government has today introduced a, a very comprehensive set of reforms for Australia's compulsory superannuation system, all designed to protect members' money and members' interests. These reforms apply across the superannuation funds equally. We are legislating a consistent minimum standard for one-third independent directors, including an independent chair, to improve governance and strengthen conflict management across the entire superannuation industry. Australians do deserve the best and brightest minds to be the custodians of their hard-earned retirement savings. Reports in the Adelaide Advertiser today, though, show us just why these sensible, long overdue reforms are needed. Serious questions have been raised about the way that the AWU appoints its people to the board of statewide super. It's been revealed today that the AWU treats board positions to the $6.5 billion industry super fund for South Australian workers like a family game of pass the parcel. The current AWU representative was appointed after the previous representative, her husband, was lobbed into the South Australian parliament for the Labor Party. He had become the AWU representative after the previous AWU representative, which was his father. Now, are we really seeing a return in South Australia to peerage? Honestly, it appears to be just another example of nepotism and self-interest by the Leader of the Opposition's AWU members putting on my his own self-interest and the interests of all those members uh, ahead of the workers as they should be. Earlier in the week, we learnt about the flow of money from superannuation funds to trade unions, but the report today tells us about the payment from superannuation funds direct to the Labor Party. The Australian Electoral Commission records show that the South Australian Labor Party received over $16,000 from statewide super in 2015-16. How on earth can this possibly be in the interests of hard-working South Australian members of statewide super? But perhaps, perhaps the member for Hindmarsh might shed some light on this matter. After all, following his election defeat in 2013, he held a position in the South Australian Services Union and between 2013 and 16, he was a director of the Board of Statewide Super at the very time that this payment was made from Statewide Super to the South Australian Labor Party. How on earth could anyone justify channelling the hard-working funds of South the Australian Minister's workers in this way? The member for Brand is warned. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you. My question is to the Prime Minister. Today is two years to the day since the current Prime Minister deposed the former Prime Minister, the member for Warringah. Is the Prime Minister aware it's reported today that the former Prime Minister has been lobbying government MPs in a bid to dump funding for renewables. Why, two years on, is the former Prime Minister still calling the shots on government policy? Prime Minister, what was the point of replacing the member for Warringah? The leader, leader of the members on my left will cease interjecting. The Leader of the House will resume his seat. The member for Greenway and others will cease interjecting. I've listened carefully to the question, and as it's framed, I don't believe it's in order. We'll go to the next question. The member for Moore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Immigration and Border Protection. Will the Minister update the House on the importance of protecting the Australian community from dangerous non citizens? What action has the government taken, and is the minister aware of any alternative Member approaches? Member will resume his seat. Members on my left, 
will not continue to interrupt when I'm trying to hear the question. I am very happy to eject them. Anyone who continues to interject, particularly those who have been warned or have been ejected under 94A on multiple occasions, I don't have a quota in mind. It's up to them. The member for Moore will begin his question again. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Immigration and Border Protection. Will the Minister update the House on the importance of protecting the Australian community from dangerous non-citizens? <laughs> what action will the government, has the government taken, and is the Minister aware of any other approaches? The Minister for Immigration and Border Protection. The Manager of Opposition Business. This Members on my right, the Manager of Opposition Business. Speaker, reflections on the Deputy Prime Minister should be made by direct motion, not through a question. There should be a motion on the notice paper. The Manager of Opposition Business is warned. The Minister for Immigration and Border Protection. The Member for Sydney has been warned. She'll leave under 94A. Master Weaver, number one. The Minister has the call. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. I thank the Honourable Member for his question. And I'm not sure how many days it is, but I congratulate the Leader of the Opposition on the anniversary of having knifed two former Prime Ministers, uh, Julie Gillard and Kevin Rudd. There must be some celebration upcoming for the Leader of the Opposition. There must be some, uh, some sort of uh, anniversary coming up for him. I note particular interest from the Member the for Grainler. The on Minister topic, for Immigration and Border Protection will come to the question he was asked. Oh. I thought it was a, reason, a reasonable preamble, from, uh, Mr Speaker. Right. I, uh, I want to thank the member for more for his question and uh, say thank you very much to all of the members on this side of the House who have supported the tough changes that this government has taken in relation to cancelling visas of non-citizens who have committed criminal offences against Australian citizens. I want to update the House on the fact that we have had now 219 visas for armed robbers uh, cancelled, 221 for theft, break and enter, 550 for assault, 54 for murder, 21 for manslaughter, 114 rapists and other sexual offenders, over 200 for child pornography and child sex offences. And this number will be of particular interest to those opposite. 150 bikies now. 150 bikies now. The Labor Party has an interest in bikies, as we know, because they provide the muscle. The outlaw motorcycle gang members provide the muscle for the CFMEU on building sites. The Cowan, so the CFMEU the is particularly is concerned with the bikies being kicked out of this country, those people that have been involved in criminal activity. And I just note that uh, for the benefit of the House. Now, it is, I am asked about Cowan alternative approaches, Mr. Speaker. It is impossible to get an alternative approach from what is known as the shadow minister for border protection and immigration in this it? house he sips nervously on a glass of water right now mr speaker but i don't i don't normally get into question time until just on two o'clock but i presume that the sedation of the member for blair takes place just before he comes into parliament <laughs> or just after he's wheeled in on a fridge trolley as i understand and three or four times during question time they take a pulse from the member for Blair to see whether he is still the alive. Minister for immigration he is the and border captain protection of... will resume his seat. The Minister for Immigration and Border Protection will resume his seat. The Minister for the Environment and Energy will cease interjecting, as will the Leader of the House. The Leader of the House, the Manager of Opposition Business. Sorry, the Member for Grindler on a point of order. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, reflections on members that was across the line to talk about. The Minister and Immigration Minister for Immigration and Border Protection will be careful with his language. He won't reflect on members. Well, let's, uh, let's celebrate anniversaries. Today is the 418th day since the member for Blair asked a question on border protection matters. Now, is it because he doesn't understand the topic? I don't think so. He's an educated man. He's a decent, he's a decent person. But he is in witness protection. He is the man who is not allowed to ask questions on border protection because he knows, like all of us and the whole Australian population, 
that this Leader of the Opposition is weak when it comes to border protection. He does not want to talk about boats. He doesn't want to talk about visa cancellations. The Minister and the Australian public has worked him out. The Minister's time has concluded. The member for Blacksland has the Mr call. Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Australian businesses are still being offered gas contracts that are double or triple the price of their expiring contracts. The gas trigger must be pulled by the 1st of November. Given the High Court may not decide if Senator Canavan or the Deputy Prime Minister are even qualified to be members of Parliament by then, why won't the Prime Minister stand his deputy aside and put someone else in the job that can pull the trigger now? The Prime Minister has the call. No, the Prime Minister has the call. Yeah, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, the uh, the trigger that on gas that uh, should be pulled immediately is the one uh, held by the Chief Minister of the Northern Territory. One of his uh, no, the, there is a very large, very large amount of gas reserves there, and of course Daniel Andrews as well. But uh, and uh, and I, uh, while I welcome the leader of the opposition's partial backflip on Victorian gas. Apparently, he's now not opposed to uh, developing. Oh, maybe I'm being too kind to him, Mr. Speaker. But I understood he wasn't opposed to developing conventional gas in Victoria anymore. But we do. We have a lot of gas in Australia, and Labor Party politics is keeping too much of it locked up. And there's a big opportunity. We had a great, a great event last night. Uh, Member for Solomon was was there, of course. Uh, uh, he spoke uh, with, uh, with Senator Scullion and uh, the great opportunity there talking about facing north and the future of the Northern Territory. Well, gas can be a great future for the Territory and they can provide a lot of gas to Australia. Now, I will just, for the benefit of the member, of Blacks, for, member for Blacksland, I'll the repeat what I said. The member for will withdraw. I withdraw. And he will now leave under 94A. Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, for the for the assistance of the member for for Blacksland, uh, I'll just repeat what I said earlier in the week. The domestic gas mechanism, which would have the effect of restricting exports to the extent necessary to ensure the domestic market is fully supplied, comes into operation on the 1st of January. It comes into operation on the 1st of January. The minister has a decision to make about that, to, about the extent of the restriction on exports to be made, which obviously is based on a lot of industry and expert advice, which is being, in the, which is being received, as I described earlier in the week. We're already seeing substantial amounts of gas coming into the domestic market, so there is, it is, in a sense. A, uh, it is, in a sense, uh, a, uh, a very um, rapidly changing environment. So, as long as the decision is taken before the 1st of January, uh, it does not. It does not matter. It does not matter. It does not matter when the decision is taken. The honourable member, the honourable member, shouldn't. And I, I I'm sure he's done this uh, innocently, uh, but he shouldn't uh, mislead the house by suggesting that the that the gas mechanism comes into effect any earlier than the 1st of January. The minister will make his decision when he is fully informed and able to do so, and then, he will, then the mechanism will come into place on the 1st of January. The member for Robertson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Social Services. Will the minister update the House on how the government is using the welfare system to improve the health and wel welfare and well-being of Australian families. Are there any alternative approaches? The Minister for Social Services has the call. Mr Speaker, I thank the member for her question. And as the member knows, the um, process of creating firmer and fairer mutual obligations really did begin with the no-jab, no-pay policy. And since 2016, 210,000 more families are immunising their kids. All categories of immunisation are pushing up to the 95 per cent target, and critically, immunisation rates for Indigenous kids at five years of age are the first to pass that 95 per cent target. So, Mr Speaker, this policy has done something that is completely remarkable. It did not just close the gap, 
On this critical measure, the gap now is in favour of Indigenous kids on this critical health measure. And, Mr Speaker, I might just pause to note that during the course of question time my attention was brought to a statement made by the Australian Council of Social Services, which I want to read to the House because it is one of the most staggeringly stupid things I've ever seen. They say no jab, no pay. They say no jab, no pay is a strategy to attack people receiving benefits. Here we have, Mr. Speaker, a policy that is giving better outcomes and better protection to Indigenous kids from polio and diseases like whooping cough than the mainstream population. And ACOS prize ideology so far over outcomes that that is their view on the policy. And we could all accept. We can all accept that when this first policy came into being, it was opposed by any number of peak bodies, peak medical bodies, academics, legal bodies, that you would think by now that people would change their minds because it's working. It's working, Mr Speaker. Australians, Australians want a safety net system that is comprehensive. They want it to be fair, but they become very frustrated when reasonable conditions are not also attached to ensure that people do the right thing by themselves and their families and their communities. And Mr Speaker, we're asked about alternatives, and we've got one from ACOS, but we've also uncovered another gem from the opposition leader. Before he picked up the Jeremy Corbyn student radical bat, and this is what he thought, this is what he thought about the welfare system. The aim has got to be not keeping them on welfare, it's getting them into a job, then they control their own lives. The sad, fact is, the sad fact is that there doesn't appear to be much room in modern Labor for that sort of common sense now. And another policy that we launched today with legislation in this House is that welfare will have automatic deductions for the payment of public housing rent. Right? The idea is to stop evictions and decrease homelessness. And the only two jurisdictions in Australia who have not come on board are the Labor jurisdictions in the ACT and the Labor jurisdiction in Victoria. You would think, you would think good common sense stuff, but not quite the ideological cup of tea of the, the ACT Minister's Labor government. The time governments. has concluded. He will resume his seat. The member, the mem member for Gorton and the Treasurer might want to have a chat behind my chair. The member for Port Adelaide. Thank you, Mr. Cool. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Yesterday, in response to a question about the seven power stations that have closed under this government, the Prime Minister boasted about an extra 2,900 megawatts of gas power generation coming online over the last decade. Can the Prime Minister confirm that every single megawatt of this gas generation came online under the previous Labor government? Does the Prime Minister take any responsibility at all for the investment strike in dispatchable energy that has occurred since this government came to power? The Prime Minister has a uh, If my recollection is correct, I was quoting from a letter from the Australian energy market operator. So the, uh, but I'll, I'll ask the Minister to elaborate on that. The Minister for Energy well, and the Environment. Well, I confirm to the House it was through the actions of this Prime Minister um, that we have now seen Pelican Point in yeah. South Australia, a gas-fired power station about to come on, Mr Speaker. And as a result of the actions of the Coalition, as a result of the Prime Minister sitting down with the gas suppliers, and as a result, Onji, the owner of Pelican Point, a 240 megawatt power station, was able to get a contract with Origin, Mr. Speaker. And what about Swan Bank E in Queensland, Mr. Speaker? What about Swan Bank E in Queensland, another gas-fired power station that the Prime Minister is helping to ensure sufficient gas for? And what about the Tamar Valley in Tasmania, Mr. Speaker? The gas-fired power station there. Mr. Speaker, we are seeing on this side of the House actions to ensure sufficient gas is available into the market. But, Mr. Speaker, we have, when the, lead, when the uh, member for Port Adelaide gets up, we just have to remind the House that he thinks a genius of an energy policy is that of his own state of South Australia, Mr. Speaker. That is his own state of South Australia, where we've had a blackout. We've had a statewide blackout. We've had more than a half a billion dollars lost in his own electorate of Port Adelaide. Adelaide Brighton is at the book of loss of $13 million, 450 jobs. As a result, they got three, 36 hours where they lost power. That's in his own electorate. 
and now the South Australian government thinks that a genius of an energy policy, a green, clean energy policy, is to spend $110 million on diesel generators, Mr. Speaker, that use 80,000 litres an hour, Mr. Speaker, that don't work in the heat, Mr. Speaker. That's the genius of the policy, taking more coal-fired power from Victoria and the Latrobe Valley, spending hundreds of millions of dollars on a gas-fired power station built by the taxpayers of South Australia. That is what South Australian Labor Party delivered in their nearly 16 years in office. If given half a chance, this Leader of the Opposition, aided by the member for Port Adelaide, will de deliver blackouts and higher prices across the country. The member for Bowman. Thanks, Speaker. Um, a question for the Minister for Health. Will the Minister update the House on the government's strategy to improve immunisation rates right across the country? Um, how does this translate into better health outcomes for all Australians? The Minister for Health. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for Bowman, who, as a uh, committed health professional, has been a strong advocate for vaccination all his working life. In March, the Prime Minister and I met with Tony Mundy. Tony Mundy is a, is a young mum uh, who had a beautiful little baby called Dana. Uh, Dana caught uh, whooping cough when uh, she wa went with her mother to the drop-off at a childcare centre of their older child. Dana was still too young to be vaccinated. In this childcare centre, there were low vaccination rates. As a consequence, uh, Dana's mum, Tony, nursed that young child as she lost and coughed uh, her way through a battle with whooping cough and uh, died only a few weeks old. Our commitment to, uh, to Dana's mum, to Tony, was to fight even harder to lift vaccination rates in Australia. And there are three big things that we are doing as a, as a government. First is pursuing the no jab, no pay policy which the Minister for Social Services has set out. We've made big changes only today through legislation uh, which has been submitted to this House. It's a policy which has contributed to over 210,000 new vaccinations, young children in Australia having higher rates. But that's being backed up by what we're also doing uh, in relation to the catch-up program for vaccinations. This has contributed to 166,000 children having catch-up vaccinations, firstly in the under-7 category, but secondly in up to the under-19s who are benefiting from the $14 million which was allocated at this budget. But thirdly, uh, what we are also doing is, frankly, through education and awareness, taking on the anti-vaxxers head-on. We have no support, no encouragement and no acceptance of what the anti-vaxxers are doing. In our view, it's anti-science, it's anti-child and it's anti-health. Yeah. And so, in that campaign, this is the not the moment I would say to the opposition warned. to try to politicise this program. What we are doing through the work of Ian Fraser, who's agreed to head this program, through the presence of Tony Mundy and her husband, who have been part of the campaign, is say to the anti-vaxxers that whether they are from one nation, whether they are from any other policy, uh, any other party, they have no place in putting that argument in Australian public life. And so this campaign is being backed with five and a half million dollars. It's taking on that, and as the AMA and the College of GPs have said, it's vital and it's successful, and it's helping save lives. Because at the end of the day, vaccination is about one very simple thing: it saves lives and it protects lives. Yeah. The leader of the opposition. Oh, thank you. My question is to the prime minister. Can the prime minister confirm? that he promised Australians economic leadership but has delivered flat wages growth, higher power prices, falling living standards. He promised intelligent debate. Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. Members on my right will not interject. The Leader of the Opposition will begin his question again. Can the Prime Minister confirm that he promised Australians economic leadership but has delivered flat wages growth, falling living standards and higher power prices? He promised intelligent debate but delivers two-word slogans instead of three-word slogans. He promised a national style of leadership but has sold out the national interest for self-interest. Prime Minister, after two years of failure and disappointment, what's really changed? How are you any better than the member for Warringah? 
The Prime Minister has the call. Really, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I'm not sure whether it's the Leader of the Opposition's lack of self-awareness or his innumeracy that causes him to ask this question on a day when we see uh, the record jobs growth and we see in the last two years half a million new jobs have been created. I mean, really, what an extraordinary, what extraordinary impeccable timing. That is, uh, you know, Mr. Speaker, when you put these things in your diary, when you say, you know, on the 14th of September, remember to ask uh, the Prime Minister a snarky question, you've got to be able to review it and just check what's happened that morning. We have to check the facts. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, what we've seen in terms of economic growth, we have seen GDP growing by 0.8% in the last quarter. It has grown by 1.8 per cent through the year. Our economic plan is working. Businesses are investing. New private business investment is grown in the, in the last quarter by 1.1 per cent to be 1.5 per cent higher than a year ago. We all know we inherited a, an economy which had, which had uh, seen mining investment uh, scale down, as, as it was always going to. And the concern was how could we get the rest of the economy to invest? Well, what did we do? We did what the Leader of the Opposition said we should do when he was in government, which was cutting business taxes. And we've done that. We've cut business taxes for companies that employ nearly half of all of the Australian workforce. And what does that do? It does exactly what, exactly what he said it would do before he did his double uh, backflip. He, it provides more investment and hence more jobs, and that's why we're seeing more jobs. So, as I said, jobs and growth uh, is not a slogan. It's not a slogan. It is an outcome. Jobs and growth. That's what we're delivering. And, Mr. Speaker, we are also ensuring that Australians get their essential services. We are, we're, we're unfreezing Labor's Medicare freeze, taking that off, getting on with that. We're ensuring that all Australians, all Australian kids, have access to consistent, national, transparent, needs-based funding. In fact, the Labor Party used to be in favour of that. They used to talk about that, but they did 27 shonky, shady deals, completely inconsistent, and then tried to stop us delivering the very vision. That David Gonski had promised. Mr. Speaker, it's been a two years of great achievement, but above all, it's two years of, since I became Prime Minister, building on the outstanding work of the member for Oringa. And what that has done, what that has done, has delivered strong jobs. Members on my left. Members on both sides. The member for Durack. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Human Services. Will the Minister update the House on the progress of drug trials, which involve a system of cashless welfare and compulsory treatment? What evidence is there supporting the benefit of these trials, and how does this compare to alternative approaches? The Minister for Human Services. Well, can I thank the member for Durack for her question? And I can inform the House that planning is well underway to have drug testing trials in three locations starting the beginning of next year. And the trials themselves involve three components. First, of course, a random drug testing of 5,000 people, and they're very good, simple methodologies to do this, which we'll be utilising. The second component is cashless welfare if a person tests positive for the first time. And we know from the independent evaluation of the cashless debit card, which operates in the member for Durax electorate, that this reduces the amount of drugs that a person takes. And the third element is compulsory treatments if a person tests positive for the second time. And of course, compulsory treatment is exactly what is used in drug courts around Australia, and studies show that it works. Now, the aim of the trials, of course, is to identify those people who might have a drug problem assist them to get off drugs and back into the workforce, and is also based on a core principle 
that welfare should not be used to support a drug habit. Yeah. Now, are there any alternatives, I'm asked? Well, we know that the Labor Party absolutely and directly opposes these drug testing trials. They say, against each of our three elements, that it's demeaning to test people, that cashless welfare is not appropriate and that you can't compel people into treatment. But on every single one of those, they've actually supported initiatives which are directly analogous. And let me take you through a couple. First of all, they support random drug testing on construction sites and on our roads. And those who get tested on our roads include, of course, people on unemployment benefits. No problem there. Second, they support using cashless welfare for drug-dependent people. Indeed, the member for Jagger Jagger set up such a scheme. They set up such a scheme. And thirdly, they actually support compulsory drug treatment programs when it is part of the drug court system. In fact, the drug policy which the member for Jagger Jagger introduced many years ago now explicitly said that the mandatory treatment uh, programs from the drug courts, and I quote, literally saves lives. And so let me, let me just confirm this. They, they first of all support drug testing as a concept, they support cashless welfare as a response, and they've supported compulsory drug treatment programs. But apparently if you put those three things together and add $10 million worth of treatment programs, it is a disaster. That's apparently the Labor way. Now, Labor, Mr. Mr. Speaker, has been captured by the Green left wing of their party. That's what's dictating this policy, and what it means they get the their way is people who need treatment. Concluded. If the member for Ballarat would cease interjecting, and the member for Boothby, we could move to the next question. The member for Port Adelaide. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. There are reports today that up to 10 coalition MPs are considering crossing the floor over the government's energy policy, like the Prime Minister did before them. Why is the current Prime Minister still letting the former Prime Minister and the right-wing members of his government dictate government energy policy? What was the point of deposing the former Prime Minister, the member for Warringa, when he's still in control two years later? Just pondering that whether it's it's in order or not. Um, I, I won't need any advice from the member for McEwen. I have to say, uh, I really don't. No, I don't think the question's in order. We'll move to the next one. The member for Benelong. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the minister for aged care. Will the minister inform the house why a reliable and affordable energy supply is important for aged care homes? Is the minister aware of any alternative approaches that would jeopardise the quality of care for older Australians? The Minister for Aged Care. The Minister for Aged Care. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for Benelong for his continued interest in aged care. I was concerned when I read in the Courier Mail, Queensland Courier Mail, that soaring power prices and shortages could disrupt services to aged care services, putting at old people at risk. You ask me what is a, a risk in all of this. I want to say that this government recognises the importance of good energy policy and security, and this is why we've taken decisive action to act on this issue. The CEO of Australian Energy Market Operator, Audrey Zibelman, said the power system does not have the reserves it once had, and therefore a balance of peak summer demand in real time provides a heightened risk to supply. I, was I know that the issues we currently face are a direct result of Labor's total lack of action on energy policy in government and their ideological pursuit of higher energy prices and an unstable energy system. Members on my left. Labor has admitted their role in creating this problem when the member for Port Adelaide, Mark, Mark Butler, said on Insiders in August everyone knew there was going to be an impact on prices. Labor's own energy white paper in 2012 
stated that there are likely to be short to medium term transitional pressures in the electric eastern market. Member These Wills, will manifest in tighter supply and higher Wills prices. Warned, Yet, despite this advice, Labor did nothing. Exactly, While the Labor Party of blackouts around the countries are twiddling their thumbs, the government has implemented mechanisms to allow the restriction, lifting the restrictions on gas exports to ensure there is an adequate supply of affordable gas for Australian consumers. The contrast could not be clearer. We have a party of blackouts opposite who are ideologically opposed to affordable and reliable energy, who ignore their own warnings and risk their policies and do nothing. This government and this Prime Minister are focused on putting downward pressure on electricity prices and ensuring that all Australians, and particularly older Australians, have a reliable source of energy into the hot summer months. That is why the building of the Snowy Hydro 2 will make renewable energy more reliable. Nothing is more concerning than to see older Australians being put at risk because of energy policies that were from the, those on the other side. We will ensure that they're cared for, the electricity reliability looks after them in their ages and during the winter and summer months when they become vulnerable. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The member for Perth and Chifley will contain themselves. The manager of opposition business. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the minister was reading word for word from his entire answer from a document. The I manager asked of the opposition table. business will resume his seat. Was the minister reading from a confidential document? The. I asked whether the minister was reading from a confidential document. Well, if you'd stop interjecting, I might hear his answer. I'm going to ask, is the minister, was the minister reading from a confidential document? Okay. Well, I'm not going to ask a question. <laughs> Leader of the Opposition. Uh, my... Leader of the Opposition. Thank you. My question is to the Prime Minister. I refer to the Prime Minister's earlier answer. If the Prime Minister considers that the energy policies of the previous Labor government were so bad, why did he cross the floor to vote for them? And why did the Prime Minister ever claim, I will not lead a party that is not as committed to effective action on climate change as I am? And finally, why won't the Prime Minister stand up to the former Prime Minister for anything other than keeping his own job? The Prime Minister has the call. Of action he talked about. I'll tell you one of the important measures of effective energy action. It's keeping the lights on. It's ensuring Australians don't have to pay the blackout bill. Effective action involves if you have a windmill and a solar Isaacs. farm, you have some backup when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. That's what's called effective. But ideology and idiocy has been the hallmarks of the Labor Party's approach to energy. I'll give you another measure of effectiveness, Mr Speaker. An effective energy policy is one where Australians can afford to pay for the energy. Labor's failed on both counts. The member for Tangney. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister update the House on actions taken by the government to defend Australian values and deliver better outcomes for welfare recipients, including in my electorate of Tangney? The Prime Minister has the Thank call. you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, Australia is the most the successful multicultural society in the world. Yeah. On Australia Day, which we defend, yeah. which we defend, we begin we begin those celebrations with an acknowledgement of country, a welcome to country, <coughs> a recognition of the 65,000 years during which our first Australians the have cared for this country. And we end with a citizenship ceremony with our newest Australians, a baby perhaps in the arms of her migrant mother. And through all of that, all of that which Labor so derides. Listen to them, Mr Speaker. 
they deride the values that Australians share. Australians love this country. They love Australia Day. They love the values it embodies. And at the heart of those values, Mr Speaker, democracy, freedom, the rule of law, mutual respect, mutual respect and mutual obligation. Now we on our side, Mr Speaker, we believe that welfare money should not be spent on drugs and booze. We believe that welfare money should not the be spent on drugs warned. and booze, but those opposite have no problem with it being spent on drugs and booze. They will not support us. How shameful. If they love those people on welfare, if they love them, if you love them, what would you do? Would you tell them to get off the drugs, get off the booze? Well, I'd hope so. We'd hope so. But no, the Labor Party won't do that. And what about the cashless welfare car? Now, Mr Speaker, I have been, I've been with my colleagues, the Social Services Minister, the Minister for Human Services. I've been there with a member for O'Connor. I've been talking to families whose lives have been wrecked by drugs and alcohol, and they call out for us to support and deliver the cashless welfare card. And I, I will never forget the mother, the grandmother in Kalgoorlie who said to me, those who criticise the cashless welfare card should look into the eyes of a child with foetal alcohol syndrome. They should look at that child. And I tell you, Mr Speaker, when we do, we do so with love. We do so with love and a compassion and the Australian values of helping our mates, looking after each other, standing up for Australia means standing up for Australia. I thank the Prime Minister. The member for Ballarat will now leave under 94A. I've warned her so many times, she's acknowledged it each time.